Hello friends. In my last video, I was complaining of the terrible reading slump that I was in for pretty much the entire month of April and May and a lot of June. But in this video, I'm going to show you all of the things that I've been loving to help me hopefully get out of that reading slump. Because I don't like being in a reading slump. Do you? Nobody likes being in a reading slump. We all love reading. We don't want to be in a slump. So basically this video is me talking about all of the things that I've been loving recently. Kind of like a favorites video, but with some more extended segments. We're going to talk about honestly one of the best books I've ever read, which which was just ironic that the best book I've ever read came amongst all of the duds that was April. And that book is The Enigma of Room 622 by Joel Dicker. Get excited for that. Plus a recent backpack purchase that I am obsessed with. Because who doesn't love backpacks? And some nonfiction books that I think might be worth checking out if you, like me, have been a little bit underwhelmed with fiction lately. If you enjoy these types of videos, please subscribe if you haven't already and ring that notification bell so you don't miss out on any of my future rants, rambles, or recommendations. Now let's get talking. Good morning. It is Monday morning and I am procrastinating. <laughs> uh, so I have a humongous video that it, oh my god, it took five hours to export the first draft yesterday, so I, that, I was like sweating the whole time because I didn't know if it was going to work. I accidentally set it to upload. I accidentally set it to export in like ultra HD, which I don't usually do. So it took a very long time to export the first draft. And after that, I was just like mentally exhausted. But today I have to do the final edit, which is arguably the more labor intensive one. And I am dreading it. I don't want to do it, but I have to do it. Um, also, in completely other news, I have decided that I want to dye one of my dresses. The dress, the silk dress that I wore to the Taylor Swift concert, some idiot, probably a man, dripped chili or something on me. And so I had like a stain on the dress. And so I was like really trying to scrub it out and the dress is delicate. And so now I have like a faded spot on the dress and... I've tried everything to try to blend that faded spot in. It's a navy blue dress. It's like this ghost stain. <sighs> so I am looking at like a fabric dye to try to dye it and blend it back in because I only wore that dress once and I'm just really pissed off at whoever dripped chili on me. I hope they have the life they deserve. Anyway, so I'm kind of procrastinating here on Amazon, shopping for a dye on YouTube, looking for how to dye clothes when really I should get to work <laughs> on this video. So yeah, I mean, I guess that's where I am now. I am procrastinating, but I will get this video done today. May maybe. Not going to put too much pressure on myself. Uh, yeah, so that's where we are. Okay, bye. Let's start with The Enigma of Room 622, one of the best books that I have read so far this year, definitely so far this year, maybe ever, if you don't count Harry Potter, because Harry Potter is just in a league of its own. I read this book in April, I think, 
And so it was a little while ago, I just never got around to talking about it. But I guess now I really just want to think back to a book that I really did enjoy reading. Hopefully that will like spur me to want to get back into reading. Saying I liked the book doesn't actually even do it justice. This book was incredible. Maybe it felt like a shining star because all of the bookends were just complete duds, but I really don't think so. I feel like honestly this was one of the best books I've ever read. I know I just keep saying that and I promise I'm going to explain why. I just, I just can't stop gushing about how amazingly written it was amongst so many boring, boring and badly written books. It's been so long since I've read a book that I felt so connected to, even though the characters in this book are so far removed from anything that is my situation or my life or my, my anything. But that's just, that's just so hard to accomplish. I feel like this is kind of an obscure pick. I didn't see very many people talking about it. I think I saw it in a few people's hauls at the end of last year. I think I first discovered it in Alexandra Roseland's video. Um, I think she had hauled it at the time, but she hadn't read it, so she didn't review it yet. So I went into this book pretty blind. I didn't have a whole bunch of glowing reviews that made me have super high expectations. I really didn't know what to expect, but reading the synopsis, it sounded like a lot of the elements in this book were things that I have been finding interesting recently, which is murder mysteries. And as I mentioned, which was one of the few things that I did like about Cherish is that whimsical kind of travel theme. And this book had both of those. So basically this book had both of those things and so much more. There was just so much going on and yet it was so easy to follow. And that's just incredible to me. I almost never felt confused or I was never left wondering like what was going on or like what was happening. All of the storylines were just so well integrated and I was never left wondering like where we were in time, how one was picking up or getting left off, connected to something else. Everything was just so seamless. It also just had a really great vibe. If anybody remembers that movie, uh, the, the Grand Budapest Hotel, it was from years ago not too i don't know a few years ago i really liked that movie it was about a hotel and like the shenanigans that go on at this hotel and i don't even really know how to describe it i just really liked the vibe of that movie and this book had similar vibes to that kind of mysterious kind of taking place in the past even though i don't think this book is taking place that far in the past but i don't know it just had that kind of vibes this is, I think, what I was actually hoping for when I read Hotel Magnifique last year, but that one, the characters were younger and it just didn't have the same vibe. With this book, the characters are all older, not super old, but they're like true adults, at least 30s, not like a teenager. So, I mean, I'm in my 30s. I just relate to older people a little bit more, so maybe that contributed, but I just thought all of the characters were so interesting and well developed and not to say that i related to all of them but i could see all of them and i could like feel all of them in a way that is really difficult to achieve like i feel like it's really hard to get a reader to feel the emotions of a character that is so unlike themselves and the main character so the main character in this book is a guy named mccare mccare is a nepo baby his dad runs this huge bank and it is assumed that mccare is going to be the president of this bank now that his father has passed away just by merit of being the guy's son it's just he is assumed that he will get the job just because his dad was the president and so McCare, he kind of knows he's unqualified for it. And he knows he's getting it just because his dad was the president. And that, he tries to act like that doesn't bother him, but it bothers him. He is anxious and he's insecure, but he tries to act like he's not. And it's like, and it's just amazing. You can see that in all of his little moments, his anxiousness. <laughs> and I don't know how I would describe exactly how I knew that McCare is anxious in any given moment, but it's just the writing is that good that you can really just 
feel the emotions of all of these characters. And that's extremely rare. So I'll just stop gushing about random things and tell you what this book is about. So to describe the enigma of room 622, I would say it is not a romance, but it is an incredible love story encapsulated in a murder mystery, which makes it all the more fun. The driving question, of course, is who committed the murder in room 622 and why it's so complicated. There are a ton of characters and a ton of players in this situation and yet everybody's characterization was just so unique that I distinctly remember everybody and not, and I didn't get confused at all. Like none of the characters blurred together. You know the books where there's like a ton of characters and it's hard to keep them all straight? I had that feeling, I think, in when I was reading like the Hawthorne Legacy or I think it, what book, what was the name of that book? With the Inheritance Games. And there were, that book had, so there were four main brothers and all of these, co like, not cousins, but like the aunts and sisters and grandpa, like it, there were a ton of characters. And to be honest, I, I had a hard time even keeping the four brothers straight because none of their characterization was nearly as strong. But just in this book, all of the characters had just such unique personalities and mannerisms that it was it was unforgettable, like the characters were unforgettable. And so there was no way to get anybody confused. One of the things that I think of when I think of a character that is just amazingly well-developed is, you know, when there's a scene where it's like a narration scene where the character is having some sort of inner monologue. And so you're reading that, but it's not really describing what exactly the character is doing. Sometimes the author doesn't really describe what the character is doing and you don't know so you just imagine they could be staring at a wall and you have no idea but in this but the characterization in this book was so good like even if the author didn't specifically say what McCare, who was honestly one of the best characters what exactly he was doing i could see him in a room tapping his foot and pacing and all of the things that i think McCare would be doing just because i under felt like i understood him so well and so it just made imagery, it just makes the imagery in your head so much more vivid without even the author having to like put the words on the page to make the imagery in your head vivid. Does that make sense? It's like the author gives you the tools to help you see the story on your own without them having to like feed you every single word. And I just feel like that's incredible. So the book starts when we meet Joel. Joel is a somewhat struggling writer. He had great success with his last book, but now he's trying to work on his next book and he has a bad case of writer's block. Joel is dating a woman. I believe her name is Sloane, but she breaks up with him because she's frustrated that he seems to be working all of the time and kind of ignoring their relationship, yet doesn't seem to be making any real progress. So after the breakup, Joel decides he needs a getaway. So he books a stay at a fancy resort hotel in the mountains. He gets there and he's walking down the hallway and he sees room 621, 621A, and 623, his room. And so he kind of notices that there's no room 622, but doesn't think too much of it. He just goes into his room 623. So then he goes out onto his balcony to smoke and there's a woman next door. She is in room 621A and she's like, hey, what do you think about room 622? And he's like, huh? he like doesn't really care, but she is very interested. And she is the one that gets him interested and gets him to investigate this with her. And she encourages him to write a book about it. I'm gonna pause here. There is obviously something going on with the two of them, but it is not what you think. If you think you know where the two of them are gonna go, it is not there and and you'll be surprised of where they end up. This is a story about love, but it's not a story about a romance between two people. It's about love in all sorts of relationships, marriages, affairs, the one that got away, father and son, mothers and daughters, friends, managers and protégés, like all sorts of relationships that you can think of. What all of these different kinds of relationships have in common is that everybody is everybody else's kryptonite. And for a while, you think there's just so much going on with all of these characters and storylines 
and dynamics, but then the message of the story comes together and it's just exquisite. I saw it early on and so I appreciated it throughout the book, but towards the end, I think it's the last line of a chapter towards the end, it says, how far are we willing to go to protect the ones we love? That's the measure of one's life. I just thought that was so beautiful and a needed message in our really individualistic society. It was just weaved together so well and it was just really fun seeing all of the pieces come together to solve this murder, which was always kind of at the forefront. It was never forgotten, kind of like I felt like it was in Tita Rosie's Kitchen Mystery series. In this book, we always knew that solving the mystery was the goal, but in order to solve the mystery, we had to unravel everything that was going on with all of these people and their loves and loyalties and the things that they'll do to help and protect one another that are questionably moral and ethical, but those gray areas are where things are happening in real life. So there are actually three timelines all happening at once, and towards the end, there's actually a fourth timeline. So the first timeline is Joel and the woman, Scarlet, there in the hotel trying to solve the mystery. The second is, I think, about five years prior, and it starts one week before the murder. So it's essentially the direct circumstances surrounding the actual murder. And the third is taking place 15 years prior to the murder. And that's where a lot of the interesting stuff happens. Everything that happens is relevant, nothing is filler, and you never wonder what's going on, why something is going on, such as an extended soccer game at the Gargoyle Court. It's just such a stunning, expertly crafted narrative, and honestly one of the best things I've ever read. So amongst all of that, you're probably wondering what's going on with Joel and Scarlett. Well, I won't spoil the final twist, but I'll just say it when you're, just when you're wondering what Joel and Scarlett really have to do with anything that's going on, because to be honest, throughout most of the book, we kind of pop in and see what's going on with them, but the interesting parts is what's happening at the time of the murder and 15 years prior to the murder. Just, so just when you're like, what are they even here for? You'll see that it was Joel all along who needed to find his true love story. And no, it's not Scarlet. Just read the book. You won't be disappointed. So, to cheer me up after my unhappy time reading Happy Place and my other unfortunate stack of duds, I decided to do what I do best, which is go shopping for a new travel backpack. So here's the thing. I really do still love the Swiss Gear Getaway travel backpack that I mentioned in a previous video. And I also really, really do love my Air Travel Pack 3 small. Link in the description if you want to check out my thoughts on either of those backpacks. But after a bunch of trips, it was becoming clear that the Swiss Gear Getaway backpack was just not the right backpack for my husband's personal item. The biggest issue with that backpack was just the layout and the fact that he's always constantly like rummaging in and out of it and trying to get things in and out, his jacket, snacks, whatever. He just can't leave the backpack alone. The way that the backpack is divided is the main storage volume is like behind a divider and the section that's not behind the divider is really slim. So in order to get something bulkier like a jacket, you're really trying to like shove through a space that is quite small. I'll, I'll put a cutaway in here so you so I can illustrate exactly what the problem is. But either way, it just doesn't really work for an on-the-go backpack. What I think that backpack really is good for is if like you're going on a weekend trip and you really need to like pack up the backpack and you're gonna just transit there and you're gonna open it up flat when you get there. Um, so it's more of a suitcase style rather than a personal item style that you'd be getting in and out of. It's like pack your things, get where you're going, and then open it up. And for that, I think it would be really good. It actually did do well when we just did a quick weekend trip and we actually did pack clothes in it. But for a personal item that has like stuff you're reaching for constantly, it's really not the best option. After a few trips of noticing that that backpack just wasn't really cutting it, I decided We've got some plans, so I'm gonna go and look for another backpack that I think may actually work better because what is travel if you don't enjoy just the journey and you don't enjoy the journey if your luggage is annoying you? So I went where everybody goes to shop for things, TikTok. I 
discovered this backpack, which was apparently viral on TikTok in like 2022, but I guess at the time, you know, to be quite honest, I think I actually did see this backpack when I was shopping for my Air Travel Pack 3 Small in early 2022. But for some reason, I think I was just really into like the backpack YouTube channels and they talk about a lot of premium backpacks. And for some reason, I thought I really needed one of those premium backpacks. If not, it was just going to fall apart. So actually, I think I did see this backpack on Amazon and I ignored it. And at that time, I wasn't really into TikTok, so I wasn't influenced by anything I saw on TikTok. But this time, when I was shopping for this bag, I was pretty open um, with the budget. I was open to buying another higher-end backpack, um, thinking that it might be worth it if we are going to travel more and if it, if it would last a long time, I thought it would be worth it. But then, I mean, also, who doesn't like to save money? <laughs> and this backpack, long story short, I could ramble about this forever, it just got really great reviews on TikTok. It got rave reviews on TikTok and on Amazon, so I decided to order it from Amazon. Um, I mean, this is like a China backpack. There are several listings that list pretty much the exact same backpack. I ordered the one from the listing Kufe. I think there's also a Kuwaz. I don't think it matters. The backpack looks exactly the same. It is completely unbranded, which is good. Neither me or my husband like big logos. So I don't think it matters <laughs> which one you order it from. So there were two different sizes. I think in the Kuwaz listing, the size options were regular and large. And in the Kufe one, the one that I ordered from, the options were large and extra large. I ordered the extra large, which is 18 and a half inches tall, 13 inches wide, and I believe it said like six and a half inches deep, but I don't think so. So yeah, this is the largest size and it is pretty comparable to the size of my Air Travel Pack 3 Small. So Air says that the Travel Pack 3 Small is holds 28 liters of volume. There is no liter listing on this bag, but I would say it's about the same. I've packed the same things in this bag that I've packed with the Air Travel Pack 3 Small and it's comparable, the shape is comparable. I mean, actually, if you go back and look at the historic, like the first version of the Air Travel Pack, it looks suspiciously like this. Um, it's updated now, now they're on the third version, it looks a little bit different. But if you look back at that first version, the original, it looks kind of like this. So I do feel like this bag is kind of modeled off of that original air travel pack. So overall, I mean, this backpack really surprised me when I actually received it and held it in my hands. I was figuring for the price, I think I paid $46.99 compared to I paid $229 for the air. I thought there was going to be a significant difference in the quality. I thought it's going to be just cheap and we may use it for a few trips. It may fall apart, but for $46.99, what can I really complain about? but I received it and I was actually really surprised with how nice it feels. So, I mean, the bag is made out of polyester, but it's not overly shiny, so it doesn't look tacky, it doesn't look cheap. I pulled on all of the seams. Um, for some reason, I feel like that's something my grandma taught me to do, <laughs> like to pull on seams to make sure everything is secure. All of the seams are secure and tight and there's no places that are like, coming apart and no loose threads. There was no information on the listing about what kind of zippers the bag had. So YKK zippers are the premium zippers. I assumed this bag was not going to have YKK zippers. I assumed it was gonna have just no name zippers, but it arrived and I was pleasantly surprised it actually does have SBS zippers. I mean, they're not YKK zippers, but they are a reputable zipper brand. So. Yeah, I mean, really pleased about that. Everything is just really smooth. The zippers don't feel like they're gonna fall off the tracks. So yeah, I mean, I'm just really surprised and really happy with the quality. I can see this bag lasting quite a long time. And to be completely honest, if I hadn't been in a headspace where I thought I needed to buy something expensive for it to be quality and for it to last, I, and if I had like, if I'd gone into a store and seen and got to touch this bag and compared it to the Air backpack, 
I don't know if I would have spent that much on that backpack. I, like that backpack, it is a tank, but it's heavy. This backpack is not nearly as heavy, so I can see it, you know, not weighing you down <laughs> so much as much as the air backpack weighs me down. That is my one biggest complaint about that one. I mean, I guess going off, this is really not relevant to the backpack itself, but this backpack, you know, I mean, it comes from China. You're supporting who knows what when you buy this kind of backpack. Air is a small Asian owned startup from San Francisco. So I do feel better about supporting them. I'm happy that I supported them by buying the backpack. And so I don't know. I mean, I may buy more things from them in the future just because I want to support them. But it's a great backpack for the price. If you're looking for a travel backpack that's not going to break the bank, that still that doesn't look ridiculous like some of like the osprey backpacks like i don't know i wouldn't be i'd be embarrassed to be walking around with some of those osprey backpacks i like that this backpack has a good layout of pockets without going overboard especially because a husband is not going to utilize a zillion pockets and keep them organized so on the front here we have two zipper pockets both of them are about the depth of my hand and they are kind of hidden under these flaps which gives them a little bit more weather protection and it just kind of disguises them for security a little bit but i mean i guess the zipper still kind of does hang down but it just gives it a cleaner look that the zippers aren't really visible they don't have a ton of volume but i feel like that's good because i don't want to encourage carrying too much stuff in these kinds of external pockets anyway because they're just not very secure on the side we have a water bottle pocket it is really not that big. It, it won't fit a lot of larger hydro flasks or those kinds of water bottles. It'll fit like a plastic water bottle, <laughs> which we don't advocate for. Um, so yeah, it's there. Behind this, there is this plastic lined pocket, good for placing anything wet or stinky that you don't want mixed with other things in the bag. The zippers come down about a third of the way, so it's pretty easy to get into and there's no other internal organization in here. So it's just a big dump pocket that you can put whatever in here. It has a decent amount of volume. It comes up quite a bit, but there is no actual gusset on the bottom. So it depends on how packed out the main compartment is, but you can put a decent amount of stuff in this pocket. Behind the main compartment, we have this separate laptop sleeve with this geometric padding foam here. Feels nice and soft and secure. Turning the bag over to the back, there's also this secret pocket here. It's, it's kind of hidden. The zipper is definitely hidden and it's good for like hiding your passport or anything that you definitely don't want pickpocketed or want to keep extra secure. And we also have this trolley strap so you can slip it over your luggage when you're rolling it around and the backpack won't fall off. Although if you are using the trolley strap, the back pocket would be inaccessible. So because the luggage handle blocks it. So you can't really use this pocket at the airport, but it's good for security when the backpack is behind you and you're just walking around. While we're here, there's also a good amount of straps to help you manage the load. There are load lifters, so you can just pull on these straps and it'll pull the bag closer to your back so that the weight is sitting more on your back rather than pulling backwards on your shoulders. And we have four of these side compression straps with secure clasps. So if you want to make the bag look a little bit smaller <laughs> once it's fully packed out, you can just tug on these and it'll compress things down. Or if you don't have the bag very full and you just want to keep everything from jostling around in there too much, you can also cinch it closed and it'll just make everything nice and tight. One thing that this bag doesn't have that other bags such as my airbag do is it doesn't have any D-rings or external attachment points. So if you did want to hang something off of the external of the bag, you would need to hang it either from this top handle or from one of these straps. That's not too big of a deal for me, but I know some people really like to hang things from the outside of the bag. So that's just something to keep in mind. We have a full clamshell style opening, which I love, it's my favorite. I will never have a backpack that doesn't have a full clamshell style opening ever again. It's just so convenient. It's just super easy to get stuff in and out and to really pack things in efficiently to make the best use of space. On the front flap here, we have an assortment of pockets. Only one has a zipper though, and the other ones are pretty loose. So 
small items might slip out when you open the bag like this, so keep that in mind. There's also a zipper pocket on the back, good for securing paperwork or other small accessories. And there's also this little zipper on the side, which is a little weird, I have to say. This, this is where the cord for the external charging port is. It comes with a cable, by the way, but not the power bank. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a little bit. And if you're wondering what this flap is, this is the external shoe compartment. On the bottom of the bag, we have two little vent holes and you can actually unzip the bottom of the bag. And there is a storage compartment here that um, they say you can like stuff dirty things, shoes, or pretty much anything that you want separated in this compartment to just keep it away from everything else in the bag. I'm not sure how I feel about these in general. I can't think of really what I would use it for. And this thing just flapping around in the main storage kind of irritates me <laughs> to be honest, but it's whatever. So I have some items here to demonstrate the capacity and to show you how I would pack the bag for either a short-term trip or an airport carry-on emergency where my carry-on is getting checked against my will and I need to stuff as many essentials as possible into the backpack. So this packing cube has about three or four days worth of clothes, plus my slippers and my packable towel. So I can just shove that right there. This is just a pretty average size toiletry bag. I think it has dry toiletry items, plus other little miscellaneous items. And I can stick that right there. A clear TSA liquids pouch right there. Another pouch filled with electronics and tech items. You can go right there. And for funsies, I also have a pair of men's sneakers that I will put right here. Let's see. Let's stick those right there. And as you can see, it still zips up relatively easily. I am tucking things a little bit in, <laughs> to be honest, to try to get it closed, but it's not a huge struggle. All of that fits relatively well. So I'm just going to close up these clasps just to make everything all nice and tight. And yeah. There we go, we are packed. The only thing that I think is a little bit weird about this backpack is this charging port. To be honest, like, I don't know. I mean, I guess this is kind of a selling feature for a lot of bags, but I've never been really impressed <laughs> with these. I don't really see the point in using them because like you still have to put your own power bank in there and you still, if you're plugged into that, will still have like your lightning cable sticking out. So I don't really see the point. The way that they assume that you would store your power bank, I think is a little bit weird. So there's like a little interior zipper where the charging cable is stored. So, but it goes like directly between the lining. And so when you, when you unzip the backpack, like the foam lining is just in there. So I don't know if you're supposed to stick your power bank in there next to this foam. Is it flammable? Like, I feel like it would be flammable. So I don't, I don't know if I would really feel comfortable sticking my power bank in there with the foam. Um, I don't know. It's just a little bit weird, but if you're not going to put your power bank there, and to be honest, and I don't even really know if larger power banks would fit. I did just for size, um, try to s shove in my 10,000 milliamp power bank and it fits, but it's tight. So if you have a 20,000 or anything larger, it will definitely not fit in there. Um, but I wouldn't even really feel comfortable putting my 10,000 in there with how little wiggle room it has. So I don't know. I think that feature is kind of half baked. I don't know how many people actually use that in a practical way. I don't really see what's wrong with just putting your power bank in a front pocket and just putting it all in there. Yeah, so that is my one complaint that I think is a little bit weird and not really well designed. But I mean, besides that, that's really not a big deal. So yeah, I mean, very happy with it.
anyone who doesn't know, which is, I don't know if I've ever said it in a video, so maybe nobody knows, but I studied English in college. And in that major, I read a ton of fiction and poetry, old fiction and poetry. I had several semesters each of American literature and British literature, and honestly, they were kind of the worst. <laughs> Actually, I had one class that focused all on the works of Edgar Allan Poe. That class was actually pretty fun. I enjoyed that one. But all of the ancient American and British literature got very, very monotonous over several semesters, and all of that was fiction. After I graduated, I swear, I didn't look back and I didn't read fiction again until like 2019. I only read nonfiction during that period. I can't really explain why. Maybe just in my head, it felt completely different from the bone dry fiction <laughs> that I was forced to read in college. I also think in a way it felt safer because it can be a little bit devoid of emotion and I felt like maybe I wasn't really in a place to handle a ton of emotion at that time. I had enough of my own and I felt like I didn't really need any extra emotions from characters. So that's what I read. I read a lot of memoirs and I enjoyed those. I read Becoming by Michelle Obama, What Happened by Hillary Clinton. I enjoyed both of those a lot, but after a while I felt like it was time for me to get back into reading some fiction. I don't even remember what I picked up first in 2019, but whatever it was worked. Anyway, I think over the last few years I have gotten back into reading fiction, but nonfiction is still somewhat of a safe space for me. It's where I go when I feel like I need to detach from emotions and the figuring things out mindset and just let the facts and somewhat opinions kind of speak for themselves. I expect nonfiction to be more matter of fact and direct and to the point, whereas I expect fiction to be flowy and beautiful and entertaining and poignant and emotional. So I guess the expectations, I don't want to say they're lower, but they're just different and they're possibly easier to meet. So I'm less likely to be disappointed. So in my fiction reading slump, I decided that maybe it would be some nonfiction that would help me get back into the reading habit without all of the high expectations that comes with fiction. So I decided to start with Trick Mirror by Gia Tolentino. Gia is a writer from The New Yorker and I've read a ton of her articles and I really enjoy her writing style. She just brings things together really well and I tend to have a lot of like aha moments when I'm reading her work so I feel like it's really fulfilling to read. What makes her writing really stand out in my mind is just her exceptionally descriptive similes and general imagery kind of blended with her kind of dry sense of humor and it just really makes for a really entertaining lines that stick in your brain. Of Elizabeth Holmes of Theranos Infamy, a voice that sounded like it was being disguised to preserve her anonymity. And on Mark Zuckerberg testifying before Congress, giving off the aura of an alien trying to learn how to pass as one of us. Maybe those aren't as funny when, with me reading them as they were when I was reading the book, but I don't know, I thought they were pretty funny and pretty descriptive. And tell me you don't think Mark Zuckerberg is like an alien <laughs> who's trying to pretend that he belongs here. Trick Mirror has a ton of funny and memorable moments, but I also think it just has a really thought-provoking message, especially, and it's a message that is especially important for millennials, people my age, to kind of get through our heads. What it's getting at is how the world presents itself to us and how we interpret it is a trick mirror. It's not a factual reality. It's a distortion. This trick mirror being the internet, societal norms and expectations that essentially lie to you, telling you what you should do and who you should be. And the sooner we realize that everything that we see around us is a mirage and there isn't one true reality, the sooner we can free ourselves from the pressure and expectations that no one ever asked for. Each chapter is an essay on its own and it, each one systematically breaks down things that we've accepted as normal in our American millennial woman existence, but they don't have to be that way. Like no matter how much we're told that reality TV isn't real, that 
what we see on Instagram isn't real, we still internalize that message and compare ourselves to that unrealistic standard. How, thanks to the hashtag girlboss era of 2016, women are expected to always be hustling, always be improving something about themselves. You're never good enough, you're never doing enough, you're never beautiful enough, you are not enough, and you can never just be. Because if you are just being, that means you're lazy because you're not trying to improve on something. Wedding culture and the entire big scam that is the wedding industry. As if the more you spend on your wedding, the happier you'll be with the rest of your life. And the fact that it's still drilled into girls that marriage and kids are the ultimate goal of life. End of story, you haven't made it until you have that. The essays in this book push back on those things and more. And for me, it just feels very validating. Like I've dealt with a lot of the topics in this book and faced judgment. And it's just very frustrating like to know that I'm not the only one who's bothered by these patriarchal and capitalistic expectations. My favorite of the essays, which is probably gonna surprise no one, is called Pure Heroines, which is about the portrayal of female heroines in literature. How male characters tend to have dynamic backstories and they have layers and personalities and their conflicts are unexpected. The well-written ones, anyway. But female characters aren't as interesting. They tend to be more cookie-cutter and less layered. Why is that? And the conclusion that this essay comes to is that these somewhat stale female characters are just a reflection of our reality in the sense that women are not often given the opportunity, women are not often given the true opportunity to explore and experiment because their lives and roles revolve around men taking care of men in their lives and supporting men's agendas. Most of their problems also stem from men, whether it's men they know being hindrances or men they don't know causing fear and apprehension about taking risks and just kind of going about in life or just having to navigate male-centric systems. And this leads a lot of female characters to be unimaginative because while the sky is the limit for men's problems, women's problems all are pretty much the same. Like it's always men cause women's problems and that's just realistic. I thought it was a great read and if you are a millennial woman like me, you probably will identify with it. If you aren't a millennial woman, maybe you won't, but I still think it's worth checking out. The second book that I really enjoyed is from none other than our friend Bernie Sanders and he says it's okay to be angry about capitalism. I am, I am angry about capitalism. Isn't Bernie Sanders just adorable? I just love his grouchy grandpa energy. This book is interesting because it's telling two stories at once, essentially. The timeline is framed from when Bernie was running for president in 2020 and through when he eventually dropped out and had thrown his support behind Biden. Like Trick Mirror, each chapter is an essay discussing a specific topic or issue relating to how unfettered capitalism is really mucking things up for us. The horrors of the American medical system, the disarray of the American education system, and the corruption of the American political system. All of these problems stem from the fact that hoarding as much money as possible from every source possible is just embedded in our American DNA. And capitalism makes things that shouldn't be for profit fair game for exploitation and making a profit. Bernie offers a ton of examples in this book, probably all of the examples that you'd probably expect, but all of them are just described in such tremendous detail. And I liked that it gave an inside perspective to a topic that a lot of us are really, like the outside looking in, but he is really in there in Congress, so he gets to, you know, know more about these things than we do, and definitely things that they don't tell us in the mainstream media. If I'm being honest, some of the sections got a little bit rambly, but I feel like that's Bernie's style. If, like me, you are angry about the way that America is headed, you'll probably like this book. It does actually offer solutions after all of the rambling, so it isn't like just one long rant. But the sad part is that all of the solutions seem just like so common sense, yet so far-fetched.
And so those are some of the things that I've been loving that have been definitely helping me get over this annoying reading slump. For a long time, I didn't even really want to take the first step in reading, which was to like find a book <laughs> to read. I couldn't even bring myself to look at some synopsises and pick one. So finally, I did the first step and I finally actually do have a little running TBR of the books that I do plan on reading soon. Mainly books in my favorite genre, cozy mystery, as well as a certain highly publicized fantasy book that has been everywhere lately. So I think that's about it for today. I'm just going to keep focusing on reading and trying to not let bad books put me off of reading. Not every book will resonate with every person and I'll just have to accept that. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you next time.